Father, we thank you today, God, you've got a word for us. Yeah. <clears throat> but Father, your kingdom does not come to us in word only, but it also comes in power. That Father, there is a demonstration of your heart through Holy Spirit in our lives today. And Father, we thank you today, God, as you get it, as we get into your word, that your word is coming alive to us, changing us, shifting us moving us out of religion deeper into your kingdom. And Father, we thank you today. God, we're getting ears to hear what you're saying to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I want you to take your Bibles this morning, and I want you to go to the book of Mark. No, I'm sorry, the book of Luke. Just testing you. Amen. The book of Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and verse 29. We're going to talk about the kingdom this morning. Everybody shout the kingdom. kingdom. How many know the kingdom is important? Matthew 6 and 33, Jesus said, Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and everything will be added unto you. Am I right? Luke chapter 22 and 29, Jesus says, And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me. Let's look at that again. Let's read it real clear and real easy. And I confer on you a kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. kingdom. One more time, kingdom. kingdom. One more time, kingdom. kingdom. And I refer on, confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me. On me. Jesus is telling us here very plainly and very clearly that it is a kingdom that He is conferring on us, not a religion. Are you with me this morning? And it's important because the world wants us religious. The world wants us following, hoping, maybe, someday, somehow, God will, if we do right, if we act right, if we speak right, if all the rights are in the right place, maybe a move of God will come. But Jesus said, I'm giving you a kingdom. Kingdom is different than religion. Religion is a set of ordinances or rituals that you have to do in order that God would be pleased with you. But the kingdom of God is a gift to you. Glory to God. That's good news this morning. Amen? The kingdom of God is a gift to you, and everything that God gives you, He gives it with purpose. Write this scripture down. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, I am confident. Everybody say confident. I am confident of this very thing, that the work that He has started in you, He will be faithful to complete it, under the day of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord for you this morning is God is not done with you yet. Hallelujah! God is not finished with you yet. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter what you've been through. You could have been through hell and back and back through hell and back again. But it doesn't matter. God is not done with you. Can you say amen? If God is not done with us and He is performing His work through us and in us, then it has to be a kingdom work. And the kingdom of God is very important to understand because that's exactly why Jesus came into the earth. We are good at doing religion. Not in Australia, but in America. We're good at doing religion. We're good at trying to be good. We're good at trying to do all the things that religion over the years has told us that we're to do, but we haven't been very good at kingdom. But there is a shift that is coming in the church. There's a line that's being drawn in the sand. And God has given us opportunity to step back in to what Jesus has conferred upon us as believers. <clears throat> See, religion has you positioned at a bowing down and a striving state. But kingdom has you standing upright with a ring on your finger, a robe on your back, shoes on your feet, and a crown on your head 
to do business in the name of the Father for the expansion of His kingdom in the earth. Amen. Isn't that good news? Yeah. We sang about it this morning. Neil talked about it a little bit this morning. Tom talked about it a little bit this morning. Kingdom is power. Kingdom is God's glory in your midst to do what needs to be done. I want to say something here that may shock you, but religion says this is all about you. It's not about you. It's about Him. Kingdom is about the King. It's about Jesus. And whenever you sell out to the kingdom and you surrender to the kingdom, it is the King's responsibility to make sure that everything that you need in your assignment is provided. Isn't that good? See, your assignment is not in heaven. Your assignment is in the earth. Your gift isn't going to be needed in heaven. <laughs> no healing is going to If you've got a healing ministry, it's not going to be needed in heaven. If you've got a deliverance ministry, no demon is going to make it in there. Amen. You're not going to cast no demons out in heaven. Amen. Your gift and your calling and your purpose is needed right here in this earth, in the places that God has you living, working, and doing life. And I believe that before we leave this place today, there's going to be a great activation in your life concerning your purpose in the earth. Look at someone and say, God's releasing purpose through you. How does He do that? How does He position us to be able to be sons and daughters of the King? He makes you an ambassador. I want you to look at... Um, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Paul writes this. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making His appeal through us. Do you get that? Look at that. We therefore are Christ's ambassadors as through God, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you as on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Yeah. Be reconciled to God. That we're reconciled to be rejoined again for purpose. When we hear the word reconcile, a lot of times if we're hearing it through religious ears, we're thinking, oh, you dirty, rotten sinner, you, you wretch of a man or you wretch of a woman, you need to come and spill your guts in the altar and be reconciled with God. That's not what that means. It means you need to be reconnected for purpose. Yeah. And each of you in here have purpose. You were created with purpose. You were created with an end game in mind God knew your days from beginning and end, and He planned them. Amen? Sometimes we get so frustrated with church, we get so frustrated with religion, we think, I don't even want to be a part of that anymore, I don't want to do that thing anymore, and I just want to say to that, praise God. Amen? Because God never told you to go to church. He never did. You can't find it in the Bible. He never told you to go to church. He told you to be the church. That's different. When we look at the building and we say, let's come to church. Well, everywhere you go, there you are. So everywhere you go, church is. It's not this building. Amen. We congregate together as the church. But each one of us in here, we have purpose. We have a destiny from God. And God is saying to us, reconcile back to Him for purpose. Not to appease, but for purpose that His kingdom would come and His will would be done in the earth through you and for Him. Does that make sense today? See, God is ready to move on the Sunshine Coast. Hey, I believe that today. God is ready to pour Himself out in a mighty way through signs and wonders and miracles and gifts but it's not going to be through the open heavens and it's just pouring out like a river into the earth. It's going to be through you. For God said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Out of you, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Amen? Not the preacher, but you. Excuse me if I get a little bit excited this morning. 
Amen. You are to carry the kingdom of God into every place that you do life. And when you are in that place, you are there as an ambassador of heaven. God's saying reconcile to Him for purpose. See, when purpose is in place, heaven shows up. Do you agree with that today? When purpose is in place, marriages are good. Children aren't acting like little werewolves running around tearing everything up. <laughs> when purpose is in your house and religion has been evicted from your home, purpose begins to bring about the plan of God and the things that you need are there. The purpose you are here manifests and you begin to be used by God in ways you could never imagine of being used by God. God will give you divine appointments. God will bring people into your life that need what you have. Can you say amen? Paul says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Look at this next part of this scripture. It says, as though God were making His appeal through us. Now, we understand that when Paul is writing this, he's writing to the Corinthian church and God is appealing through Paul that the church would be reconciled to Him. Why? Because the church got off course. Testing one, two. I know the church in Australia never gets off course, but brother, the church in America, we miss it a lot. But Paul said that God was appealing through him. If God would use Paul to appeal to the church, then God would use the church to appeal to the world to be reconciled to Him for purpose. See, Jesus did not come to get you into heaven. I know it's preached a lot, but it's wrong. Jesus did not come to get you into heaven. He came to get you into the kingdom. He said, here, I'm bringing you a kingdom. He said, the kingdom of God is with you. Then where does heaven play its role? Heaven is our reward. Heaven is not your destiny, it's your reward. It's what you get when your body finishes living on the earth. You get to be with God in heaven. But your assignment is right here where you live. And God wants to empower you. There wants to be, wants to pour out a fresh anointing on your life today in order that you may become this ambassador. Let me give you the definition of ambassador. It is this. It is the highest ranking person who represents his or her own government while living in another country. Did you get that? It's the highest ranking. There's no one above you in the earth. When it comes to kingdom, there's no one above you in the earth. You are God's ultimate representation of heaven in the earth. And when you stand before those that want to oppose the best interests of the nation that you are from, which, by the way, is not Australia, you're from the kingdom of God. Amen? you got dual citizenship. Neil has tri-citizenship. Kingdom of God... He's a citizen of the kingdom, he's a citizen of, of Australia, and he's a senior citizen. <laughs> Amen. And a good one at that. Joanne told me to say that. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I hope to be that one day. If I'm not, I, you know, I'm dead. <laughs> but your citizenship is so important to your purpose. And if you think that you're just hanging out in earth to get to heaven, you're going to miss God's purpose for your life. You are the highest ranking person who represents the kingdom of God's government while living here in this earth. That's why Jesus said, great works have I done, but greater works will you do because I go to the Father. That's why the Scripture says that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, He lives in you and He makes alive your mortal body. That's why He said in Luke chapter 10, He said that He has given us authority to trample on the heads of serpents and scorpions and all the powers of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. 
Man, the devil better look out this week when this people enters into the world. We're going to see the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God. Can you say amen? We are heaven's diplomatic agent of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government or a sovereign as a resident representative of his own government or sovereign or appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. Wow, that's a mouthful. You have been employed by heaven into the earth for an assignment. Your assignment is not to just make it. Your assignment is to change earth to be like heaven. Wow. That's the atmosphere of heaven God wants in the earth. You may say, how can that be? This world is wretched. This world is dark. This world is evil. I believe it is that because the church has allowed it to become that. We are heaven's representation in the earth. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 16. Is this all right this morning? Wonderful. Yes, Amen. God's got something He wants to release here in the Sunshine Coast that is going to affect the entire nation. And I believe God will start it right here. Do you believe that? Yeah. Using you. It says now in verse 13, chapter 16, verse 13, now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, He was asking His disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And He said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And He said unto them, but who do you say that I am? Where God is taking us, we're going to have to stop listening to what others say Jesus is and we've got to begin to reveal who He is to us. Does that make sense? Jesus and the kingdom of God is not politically correct. Come on, smile at me on Sunday morning. It's not politically correct. The Bible says actually Jesus will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And He says, woe unto them who are offended. <laughs> right? See, when we try to appease everybody and we try to be politically correct and we try to fit in, we will never stand out. Jesus called us to represent the best interest of the kingdom of God and not necessarily Australia. Because the kingdom of God will bring the best interest of Australia out. It will make it manifest. So we cannot be ashamed. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power, if I say that, it is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe. The church has been absent of power. Why? Because religion has settled in. We're evicting religion and we're inviting in kingdom. God, Jesus said, I confer on you a kingdom. The word kingdom is made up of two words. The first word is the word king. Everybody say king. And that word king means sovereign. Now, the second word is the word dominion. Everybody say dominion. Dominion means authority over or in a territory. So when we preach kingdom, we're preaching the sovereign king's dominion, power, and authority in a territory. That territory is the place that he's called you and I as individuals to function. You have a responsibility to bring the kingdom of God where you function in life. In the book of Genesis... He said that He gave Adam authority in the earth. He said, I have given him, I bless them, they're going to be fruitful, they're going to multiply, they're going to replenish, and they're going to have dominion. That word dominion in the Hebrew is the word mamlak, which literally translates kingdom. I'm giving them kingdom. I'm giving them my dominion in the earth. 
Adam's assignment was to take the garden and multiply it into the earth with sovereign authority, with sovereign power. I want you to understand this morning where you are planted, you carry sovereign power from heaven. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's why when Peter, when he walked down the road and his shadow fell on someone, they got healed. Because Peter was the authority in his dominion. Jesus never created us to rule over one another, but to rule in the sphere of authority that he gives us individually and corporately as the body to cause the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdoms of our God. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? So when you step in your workplace tomorrow, or when you go to school tomorrow, or you're in your kitchen cooking breakfast for your children tomorrow, you are standing there with a sovereign assignment as an ambassador of heaven to cause the kingdom of God to be manifested in a way it's never been manifested right. before. Thank you. And when you do that, like Peter, you can walk through Kmart, Target, the restaurant, the grocery store, your office space, and you will carry the anointing That's it. That's that it. will destroy yeah. yokes. Yeah, See, you're not going to get everybody in the building that you want to come to church. But you could be the church and take everything that's in the building to those that are outside the building. And when you meet folks that are demon-possessed, they'll scream out, don't run, don't hide under your desk. <laughs> Amen. Don't get in your car and drive home and say, what in the name of Jesus did I just experience? No, turn and say, in the name of Jesus, you come out of that person. Amen. And you want revival in your office? You want that old mean thing you work for to be saved? Manifest the kingdom. Mm, you want that werewolf you married to be saved? I mean, that man you married to be saved? Manifest the kingdom. <laughs> this younger generation don't want nothing to do with religion. It stinks. Why? Because it gives you a hope way out there somewhere that you'll never get. The key, religion's out there, but kingdom is in here. And kingdom is conferred upon us through relationship with Jesus Christ. Not as a religious figure, but as our elder brother. The Scripture says he is the firstborn among many brothers. Am I right? That means that this is a family business. Woo! Ha ha! Isn't that good? We're not coming hoping to get in. We're already in because of birthright. Because of bloodline. We're connected to the King. He is our Father. And on assignment, we're not building for someone else. We're building the family business, which is the kingdom of God. So wherever you're functioning, Wherever you're living, whatever you're doing throughout the day, you are on assignment. Can you say amen? amen? He said here, it doesn't matter what others say, who do you say I am? And then I like Peter. Peter's a pretty good guy. He kept shoe leather in his mouth most of the time, but here he got it right. Amen? He said unto him, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Can you say amen? amen? Now look at this. He said unto him, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Watch this. I also say that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Jesus just made us a promise that if He will let Him build us into a church, that the gates of hell will not be able to overpower who we are in the earth. Can you say amen? Verse 19, it gets better. He said, I will give you the keys of a religion. He didn't say that, did He? He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, 
and whatsoever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is conferring a kingdom upon us, not a religion. You can have all the keys in the world in your hand, but if you don't have the right door to put that key in, it's not going to open. God has given us keys to open door in every sphere of society, and those keys are keys of the kingdom. The keys of the king's sovereign domain in the earth. Jesus, when He came back, or when He came, uh, when He was born, He did not come to retrieve a religion. The Bible says that He was born under the law that He might deliver them who are under the law. Did you get that? He might bring those that are under the law out from under the law and place them in this thing called freedom. Man, that's good. Freedom means not bound. Nothing binding us. Amen? He says He makes us free just for the sake of being free. No obligation, you're free. But when He makes us free, we attach our heart to Him and we become His bondservants. We're going to serve Him all the days of our life. I love that song that we sang this morning. It messes me up every time. That He has always been faithful. All of you in here, you can look today and you can see the faithfulness of God in your life. He's always been faithful to us. Why not follow Him? Why not be reconciled to Him for purpose? Your assignment is not just to live and to die. Your assignment is to leave such a mark in the earth that it brings glory to the King. Whether you're a businessman, God wants you to make so much money that you can sponsor so many missionaries in the gospel of the kingdom in the earth that nations would be changed. Can I tell you a story real briefly this morning? I'm going to tell you a story that I'm going to close. My first closing. In America, we usually do three, so I'm on number one. There is in Ireland a beer company. What's the name of that beer company? What's the name of that Irish beer? Uh, Guinness. Thank you, brother. We had one back there that knows. I'm just testing you. I noticed it wasn't shouted out all over the place. But the guy that started Guinness Beer Company was walking through the park one day and he saw a man sitting on a bench crying, weeping. And he came up to him and he said, Sir, why are you crying? And the man said unto him, God has called me to be a missionary to China and I have no one to send me. And he said, I'll send you. And so the man that owned Guinness Beer paid for this man and sponsored him not only to get to China, but to live and do the work of a missionary in China. And he wrote back and he told him, we need more missionaries. Would you send more missionaries to China? And from what I understand of the story, there were hundreds of missionaries that were not only sent to China, but around the world because of a man that heard God who owned a beer company and let God use him to spread the gospel around the world. Now, religion has trouble with that. They say a beer man, well, maybe another businessman who might have been saved wasn't hearing God and God needed the beer man. Bless Guinness, hallelujah. Because many people have come into the kingdom because of that business. And if that makes you angry, you need to check up in your heart today. People are getting saved. (laughs) That's kingdom. That's kingdom. Let God bless your business so much that if people find themselves in front of you weeping that you've got the need, the, the means to send them to the nations of the world. 
That's kingdom. We're ambassadors of God. We have royal position in the earth. My second closing. He said unto him, he said, Upon this rock, upon this revelation, I'm going to build my church. The idea of church in the heart of Jesus is much different than what we see manifested in the earth today. Church is not cathedrals, stained glass, steeples, large buildings where people gather to try to do a religious service. The word church that Jesus used in this passage of Scripture is so very important. You see, when we read our Bible, we cannot read it through our culture. We have to understand first who said it, who was it said to? What did it mean in their culture and their time? And then how does it apply to me? So when Jesus used this word church, it was a Greek and a Roman term. The word church to the Greek meant the elders that sat at the gate. And they determined what could come in a city and what had to leave a city. Jesus said, I'm raising up a church. In the Greek is ekklesia. I'm raising up an ecclesia that will sit at the city gates and determine what has permission to come into our towns and what must be evicted from our towns. We have given that over to religion and religion has brought all kind of garbage into our nations. But Jesus is saying, I'm raising up a church. I'm raising up a people right here on the sunny coast that will begin to stand as ambassadors of the sovereign and begin to decree what must leave our city and what must come into our city. Can you say amen? amen. That's you he's going to use. The word church to the Roman meant this. When Rome would conquer a city, and you all know Roman conquered a lot of cities, right? When they would conquer a city... They would take an envoy of people and they would send them. They were called an ecclesia. But the word ecclesia to the Roman was our English word senate. Do you guys have a senate here? So they made the laws and they enacted the laws. So they would take a group, an ecclesia, and they would send them into a conquered city to live. And when they got into that conquered city, they came with Roman authority. They didn't go before the board or the council of the conquered city and say, may we have permission please. No, they came in with the authority of Rome. And they did several things. Their main assignment was to change culture. They changed the street names. They changed the food. They changed what they wore. They changed the architectural structure of their buildings. If you ever go to Israel or Jerusalem, you'll see that most of the architecture work that's there was made by the Romans. Why? What was being built in Rome, they wanted it built in that conquered city. They also changed the currency and they put Caesar's face on the currency. You remember the story in the Bible where they came to Jesus and they said, why do your guys not pay uh, taxes? And Jesus said, or should we pay taxes? And Jesus said, give me a coin. And he said, whose name's on the coin? It's Caesar's name and Caesar's face. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Amen? They were there changing culture. So the ecclesia, you and I, the church, we are sent into a place not to adapt to culture, but to change culture. You carry within you the authority of heaven. That's why when the sick come, you can lay hands on them and see them healed. Why? Because sickness does not belong in the culture of the kingdom. Amen. That's why when someone's demon-possessed, you can cast demons out of them. Why? Because to be in the kingdom, you must be a citizen, and demons have no citizenship. They don't even get a visa, praise God. Isn't that good? That's why when you go into a place, you carry authority with you. You may say, Apostle Greg, I don't have a great influence. You've got family. Quit preaching religion to them and demonstrate kingdom. 
The kingdom of God does not come in word only, the Bible says, but in power. How do we activate the kingdom? My third closing. We reconcile ourselves to God for purpose. Think about that. Why are you here? None of you are an accident. None of you are a mistake. None of you just happen to be. Each of you that are in the earth today, everyone here has purpose. And God wants to stir and activate that purpose in your life. Whether it's in ministry or whether it's in business or arts and entertainment or media or whatever it may be, God wants to stir you for purpose. Why? Because there's people where you are that need the kingdom. They need the king. Does that make sense today? I want to pray over you today. If we could have our musicians just come back. Father, I thank you today for what you're doing in this place. I thank you, Father, that there is purpose here. But Father, Your Word showed us today that purpose comes through people. And I thank You, Father, that everyone in this place this morning is arising to purpose. Father, I pray today that You would just, You would remove the scales from our eyes and let us begin to see where we have been held captive by religion. And how we can step in to kingdom. Father, today I thank you right now that every hurt and every wound and every bit of bitterness, Father, every bit of agitation that religion has brought in the lives of your sons and your daughters, I release healing into their life today. And Father, I decree over them this morning, dear God, an awakening within their life, an awakening within their heart, within their soul for kingdom purpose. Come on, just begin to pray in the Spirit. Would you do that? Father, I thank You that You are in this place. <clears throat> Father, that Your love is in this place. Father, that You're desiring to minister to and to bring people into life. Holy Spirit, do the work of the Father's heart in here this morning. I want to ask you to do something today. Something very bold. If you're here this morning and you've never invited Jesus into your life, I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. You may be here this morning and you say, Greg, I, I've been to church, I've done all that stuff, but I, it's just not me. That's good. It can be you in the right perspective as Jesus as your King. This morning, I want you to understand that for Jesus to get you back in this place of purpose, He came to this earth, He died for you. He rose again, and now He's seated at the right hand of the Father, ready to release purpose into your life. It says in John 3 and verse 3 that in order to get into the kingdom, you must be born again. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, and you say, hey, I, I want to do that today. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Would you just lift your hand? I want to pray for you. Anyone in here? You say, I want to surrender to Jesus. I'm tired of living the way I've been living. That may be religiously. <laughs> you may be just being a good lost person. That's all right. You want Jesus in your life this morning. Just lift your hand. Amen. Anyone else? You say, I want to give my life to Christ. I just feel like there's some in here that want to do that. Don't be ashamed. All of us are where you are one time in our life. And we surrender to Jesus and He's radically changed our life. Amen. This morning, 
you lifted your hand, I just want you to pray this prayer out loud with me. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose from the dead. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name. You're born again. You're saved. Would you stand with me for just a moment? All of you just stand with me. Praise your name, Father.